this is not something I just now studied. I taught a whole series on this 12 years ago. I called it a scriptural church service. And when I put that series together, I just covered thoroughly the whole book of Acts. And I was just impressed in my heart that day as I prayed to read the book of Acts again and to get back into this and look at the early churches and see how they did things, see what went on. And I want to just share along those lines tonight. Be turning in your Bible to Acts chapter 2. Now in verses 14 through 40, we see that on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached a sermon. And in verse 41, we see that 3,000 were added unto them. And now, what did they do next? Look at verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowships, and in breaking of bread, and in prayer. Notice they did four things. Number one, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Number two, in fellowship. Number three, and in breaking of bread. Number four, and in prayers. Now that word steadfastly, if you look it up in the Greek portents, it means to persevere, to give oneself unconditionally, to be constantly diligent in, steadfastly. Now what were they giving themselves to? What were they being constantly diligent in? Number one, the apostles' doctrine. If you look that word up in the Greek, it's number 1322 in Strong's Concordance, and it means instruction or to teach. That word fellowship means participation or social intercourse. In other words, close intimacy. The believers in the early church had close intimacy. They continued steadfastly. They gave themselves to being close, a close-knit family. The word breaking of bread. When I looked that up in the Greek, I learned that it refers to the Lord's table or communion because in the Greek it mentions the table of shoe bread if you look these words up. Fellowshipping over the Lord's table in communion was a vital part of the early churches. And the fourth thing that they continued steadfastly in was prayers. If you look that word prayers up, it means to pray earnestly for and it also means to worship. So they prayed earnestly. They were steadfast in their prayers and in their worship. And in verse 46, we see that if they continued daily in the temple. They met daily. And in verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily. Now, how many churches do you know today that are increasing daily? You know any? Why aren't they? What did the early church do that caused this to happen? Let's look at these four things. Let's look at prayer first in verse 42. They continued steadfastly in prayers. Now, in Acts chapter 3 is recorded the healing of the lame man as, as Peter and John were on their way to the temple to pray. And as a result of the healing of that lame man and Peter's preaching in Acts 4.4 4 says that 5,000 men believed. Now that's not counting women and children. 5,000. But I want you to remember that their sole purpose for going to the temple was to pray, to have a specific season of time in prayer. Acts 3 and verse 1 says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Their goal was prayer, and the lame man was healed on their way to fulfill their goal or their purpose. They were going to the temple to have a time of prayer. You see, they had been with Jesus for three and a half years of his earthly ministry. They had watched him and walked with him and watched what he did. They had seen how Jesus spent time with the Father in prayer. And then he would come forth from those seasons of prayer and he would minister and heal the multitudes and teach and preach the word. But he spent time with the Father first. There were many times in the scriptures that we'd find where Jesus spent all night in prayer to the Father, fellowshipping with Him, and then He came forth and He healed the multitudes. So they were accustomed to seeing Jesus pray, and they understood that prayer was a vital part that they were to continue steadfastly in, like verse 42 says, in prayers. Now, in Acts chapter 6, we see that the widows were being neglected. So the disciples said, 
choose you out seven men full of the Holy Ghost. And Acts chapter 6 verse 4 says, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Notice, they gave themselves to prayer first, and then they had the anointing to minister the Word of God in the power of the Spirit. If they gave themselves to prayer, don't you know they spent more than 10 or 15 minutes praying? If they gave themselves to it, if they continued steadfastly in it, it takes more than 10 or 15 minutes sometimes just to get our flesh man quiet, doesn't it? So we can get in the Spirit and hear from God. Now, we'll come back to this verse a little later and look at it in detail. But I want to point out that they made prayer their number one priority before anything else. In Acts chapter 16, verse 13, Paul said, On the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. The King James is a little unclear sometimes when they use words like that. That word want, W-O-N-T, means or as the custom was, or where prayer was usually taking place. So it was the, a customary place. A lot of times in the word, the word says concerning Jesus, he went to a certain place to pray. And in Acts 16:16, 16, 16, Paul said, and it came to pass as we went to prayer. All through the book of Acts, I saw as I read it again that they were continually going to prayer, going to spend time with the Father in prayer. Acts chapter 4, 29 through 31, they prayed for boldness, and the place was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke the Word of God with boldness. And in Acts chapter 12 and verse 5, Peter was in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing by the church, it says, for him. And we know how that an angel came and delivered him out of prison. And my footnote says that instant and earnest prayer was made. Instant and earnest prayer was made by the church for him. So we see that prayer and intercession was going on in the church. It was a part of the early church. Acts chapter 16, verses 19 through 40. While in prison... Paul and Silas prayed, and they sang praises. And there was a great earthquake, and all the prison doors were opened, and everybody's chains fell off. So we see in Scripture after Scripture where prayer was a vital part of the early church. They made it their number one priority. And now let's look quickly at another way that the early churches conducted their church services. I want us to talk for a minute about body ministering. We begin to just minister to a small degree this way on our Sunday night services that are set aside for Holy Ghost meetings. This was commonplace. It was an everyday thing in the early church. Turn to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 14.26. I've got a lot of scriptures, so a lot of them I'll just give you the references to, and we won't turn to them for the sake of time, so you can just listen quick, since I'm having to condense a whole series down into one teaching. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, let all things be done unto edifying. That word doctrine in the Greek means an act of teaching or instructing or tutoring. So we see that teaching was a vital part in the New Testament church, and God wants it to be a part of our church today. You're all familiar with tongues and interpretation, so we're not going to take time to talk about that tonight. Let's look at revelation, that word revelation in verse 26. In the Greek, it means an uncovering or an unveiling or a disclosure. Revelation comes when you're reading the Word and the Holy Ghost just begins to uncover or unveil it to you and just begin to show you something out of the Word that you've never seen before. Even though you may have read that Scripture a dozen times, yet you see it in a whole new light because the Holy Spirit just sparks something in that verse to your heart and it becomes life. It becomes life to you. That's a revelation. The word psalm, if you look it up, this word psalm means a spiritual poem or an ode and it may or it may not rhyme but it'll have an element of poetry about it. Now let's think about it a minute. How will everyone have a doctrine, have a revelation or a psalm or tongues or interpretation when they come to church? Ephesians 5, 18 through 20 says, be filled with the Spirit. How are we to do that? How can we be filled with the Spirit? The next 
part of the verse tells you, by speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, to the Lord. That's how we will be filled with the Spirit. If you speak to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs all week long, you're going to be full of the Spirit of God when you come to church. So you will be a capable vessel for the Holy Spirit to speak through and minister through. If you to yourself, as this verse says, you'll be amazed. You will be amazed at how much your spirit man is edified and built up. Psalms, out of all of these things mentioned in this verse, psalms are my favorite. I love to speak in psalms. Just get over in the realm of the Spirit and speak in psalms. I can be at home and just get over in the realm of the Spirit and I can look up and an hour's gone by or maybe two hours have gone by. And it seems like just minutes. And there have been a few times where when I've gone to bed, I just have spoken psalms all night long, not slept a wink, not closed my eyes, just speaking in psalms from my heart to the Lord all night long. I love psalms, and I love especially psalms that rhyme, because I know in my natural mind I don't have the ability to rhyme words. So I know that that's of the Spirit. I love psalms so much because I'm not musically inclined, and I'm not gifted with singing. If you are, then singing hymns and spiritual songs may minister to you more. It's just however you can edify your spirit best is what you should practice. Be steadfast. Do it deliberately. Do it all the time. You can make everyday chores labor and burdensome, or you can make them enjoyable. The only time I sing is when I'm vacuuming or in the shower, because nobody can hear me. And when I'm vacuuming the floors, I can just sing and just get the spiritual songs, because I know nobody's listening. It won't matter if I'm off key. There was one night when I was just vacuuming away and suddenly the Holy Ghost stepped in and just dropped a, a spiritual song in my heart in tongues. And I sang it in tongues and then he gave me the interpretation in English. And I tell you what, me and that vacuum cleaner just danced all over the floor because I was practicing this verse. And we are to do this all week long. Then when we come in church, we will be ready. We will be filled with the Spirit speaking. We have been speaking to ourselves all week long. Then when we come, the Holy Ghost will have a vessel that He can use. Amen? Amen. Speak to yourselves all week long. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now I want you to notice and I want to point out that we're not only to edify or build ourselves up this way with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, but we are to minister to the Lord during the church services this way. Acts 3, 2 says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, as they ministered to the Lord. When we come, we should have church services where we do nothing but minister to the Lord. Just as we minister to ourselves and speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs all week, we should have times when we come to the house of the Lord and minister unto Him. The early church did as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. They had to have been practicing ministering to the Lord in that church service because we see that the Holy Spirit came on the scene. Hagen says that when he pastored churches that they would have whole meetings where they didn't do anything else but minister to the Lord. That's all they did. He said that he would sit down over in the corner and he'd say, we're not going to pray for anybody or teach the Word. This is the Lord's time. And he said people would just be led by their spirits. He said someone might sing a song. Someone else might read some scripture. Someone else might speak in prophecy. Someone else might get up and begin to dance in the Spirit. Where he said sometimes they'd just sit quietly in reverence and awe of the Lord for 45 minutes or an hour at a time. Nobody speak, nobody moving around, just sitting in His presence, reverencing and honoring and loving Him and adoring Him, just ministering to the Lord. Now I want to look at another area that the early church practiced. And we're just going to cover the Scripture and let the Word teach us and the Holy Ghost be our guide. Be turning to Acts chapter 6. Remember we talked about this briefly a few minutes ago, 
we talked about how the widows were being neglected in the church. Look at verse 2. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Notice it says that they were all ministering the word. It says that we may give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Did you notice that? In Acts chapter 11 verses 25 and 26, Paul and Barnabas, they stayed for a whole year at the church at Antioch and they taught much people, the scripture says. It says they taught. That means that they were both doing the ministering, doesn't it? And not just one of them if they taught. Acts 13 verses 1 and 2 says, Now there were in the church there was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, and it lists them by name. So some of the men that were set into that church were prophets and some were teachers. I want you to be noticing the plural ministry more than one as we look at the scriptures in the book of Acts. Turn to Acts chapter 15. We're talking about what happened in the early churches, how the early churches conducted their services. In Acts chapter 15, there was a dispute over whether the Gentiles should be circumcised or not. Look at verse 6. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. Now those elders and apostles were in leadership in the churches and they were responsible for making the decisions. We know this because if you look in verse 22, the apostles and the elders made the decision to send men to Antioch. So they were in charge of the church. They were in leadership. The apostles and elders, more than one, plural. Be turning to Acts chapter 20. We see in the last part of that verse where Paul called the elders, plural, of the church. Do you see that? The church of Ephesus He's talking directly to this particular church, and he called the elders of that church. And we see in verses 18 through 28, when they were all assembled or came together to him because he had called them, then he exhorts them. And in verse 28, he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Notice that. He exhorts the apostles and the elders to do what? Feed the flock. Minister the word to the church. Do you know if there's just one person doing all the ministering of the word, you know you'll get burned out doing that? If you give and give and give and give and give continually and do all the ministering, there will come a time when you'll be empty. There was a time several years ago when I ministered at least three usually four times a week. I had, for a while, I did a Sunday afternoon radio broadcast. I usually ministered the Word on Sunday night. Most of the time I had the Wednesday night services. I always taught a Friday night Bible study every Friday night. And then there was also times in that time frame that I ministered in tent revivals. And I ministered almost every night. And let me tell you, you can't do that on and on, day after day after day. You would get burned out if you minister and if you are the one doing all the ministering. There was a lot of times I would leave work, drive with one hand, eat my sandwich on the way to church, minister the word, turn it out, and you'll come up empty. That is, you'll see it scripture after scripture where there was plural ministry in the book of Acts. God set in the church apostles, set in the church elders, plural. In Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul is writing this epistle to the saints that were at Philippi with the bishops or overseers and elders. That's what bishops mean. Now this is Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. We see again where several people were in charge of the, the services. First Peter 5, 1 Peter 5.1 is another example. It says, The elders which are among you I exhort. And if you look at that scripture, notice what he exhorts them to do. Verse 2 tells you there in First Peter 5.2, it says, Feed the flock of God which is among you. We'll take time to look this scripture up. Acts 14.23, because I want you to to get it in your spirit and see scripture after scripture, the ministry, how the early churches were set up and how they were ran and what happened 
in the early church in their church services. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. I started in, in 22. Drop down to 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them unto the Lord on whom they believed. Now notice, in every church that Paul and Barnabas started, they ordained elders, plural, more than one. Because, verse 22, as we read, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them. That's how they exhorted them, the disciples to continue in the faith. And we see in verse 43 that they ordained elders in every church and prayed over them with fasting. They commended them to the Lord. They set them in the office of elders, plural, in the New Testament church in Acts and in the epistles. First Corinthians 12, 28, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, Thirdly, teachers. Notice that God set them in the church, that scripture says. So this was ordained to God, not a man, to have plural ministry or to have elders ministering the word. More than one, more than one did the ministering in scripture after scripture that we looked at in the early church in their services. It was their job to deliver the mind of the Lord to the people. We don't see anywhere in the book of Acts where the churches were established with just one doing all the ministering. And I believe that the churches should be established this way today because just one person is not going to carry the anointing for every service. And that person in leadership in the church should be able to say, I don't have the word of the Lord. I don't have the anointing to minister in this service. And one of the other leaders should be able to say, I have it. I have it. God's given me a fresh word and I'll share it. And if that takes place, then there'll always be meat in mine house. There'll be meat in the house of God when we come together. Did you know that in the old days of the Pentecostal movement, they ministered this way? It's unfortunate that in the charismatic movement, they got away from this because in the book of Acts, it was how God started the churches. It was an everyday occurrence in the churches for plural ministry for the elders the deacons, the bishops, to be ministering the word. In the Azusa Street meetings, have you ever read about them? They had several services a day for over three years, and they never had a scheduled speaker. They never planned ahead who was going to speak at those services. And some of the greatest miracles happened in the Azusa Street meeting. Remember John G. Lake? He was the one that the bubonic plague germs died when they touched his hands. He ministered a lot this way. He and several men ministered together. And whoever had the word of the Lord for that time was the one that ministered. And I've read where sometimes Lake would be up ministering the word and one of the other men that ministered with him would raise their hands and say, John, let me drive that point home. And John G. Lake would let that man speak. And most of the time it would be the key to turning that whole service and cause the miracles to begin to occur. What I'm saying is one person doesn't get everything there is from God. We see it all through the book of Acts. I went to a convention several years in Georgia where they ministered this way. There would be plural ministry. There would be at least two, usually three or four men who ministered the word. There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians 3.10 that says, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. Ephesians 2.20 says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And after you have two or three ministering this way, adding line upon line, line upon line, when they finish with that meeting, you've got a whole building because they've each shared their part and they've each shared under the anointing and what God has given them to share. And we've looked at all these scriptures, how that the early churches were established and how the services were conducted in the early church and the miracles that occurred and most of all how God added to the church daily and we can look at the churches today and ask are these same things happening is God adding to the church daily is people coming in daily are miracles happening in the churches today like they did in the book of Acts and if they aren't why not which one's right the early church or the church today which one had God ordained how did he ordain it to be set up? If his Holy Spirit came in power with signs following the word that caused miracles to happen, people to be saved daily, 
and to come and be added to the church daily. They must be right, don't you think? As the psalmist David often says in the book of Psalms, which means pause and calmly think of that. Amen?